Amen. Well, it's good to be in the Lord's house tonight, and we thank Him for all His many blessings. Uh, this song's been on my heart. <clears throat> uh, actually, the last several weeks, uh, dealing with storms, and uh, not just the rain and the tornadoes and all the things we've been dealing with here recently, but just the storms in our lives, the storms in our country, and uh, I hope this song speaks to us tonight. dark of the midnight have I oft hid my face while the storms howl above me and there's no hiding place mid the crash of the thunder precious Lord hear my cry keep me safe till the storm storm passes over till the thunder sounds no more till the clouds roll forever from the sky hold me fast let me stand in the hollow of thy hand keep me safe till the storm passes by Satan whispered, there is no need to try, for there's no end in sorrow, there's no hope by and by, but I know thou art with me, and tomorrow I'll rise where the storm never darken the sky. the storm passes over till the thunder sounds no more till the clouds roll forever from the sky hold me fast let me stand in the hollow of thy hand keep me safe till the storm is by when the long night has ended and the storms come no more let me stand in thy presence on that bright peaceful shore in the land where the tempest ever comes Lord may storm passes by till the storm passes over till the thunder sounds no more till the clouds roll forever from the sky hold me fast let me stand in the We've got a refuge tonight, and uh, I'm glad we've got a place to run to, and uh, I'm glad that we can be sheltered in the cleft of the rock. Amen. Take your Bible, if you will. We're going to continue our study in Psalm chapter number 25. Psalm chapter 25. We were going to go ahead and move on to chapter 26, and uh, there's so much in chapter 25. 
I feel uh, that we would be doing an injustice uh, to the writer of the Psalms, of course, by the Holy Spirit of God, but the hand that was used, the Psalmist David, and <clears throat> we find that this is a prayer, uh, a Psalm of prayer, and uh, we're going to we're going to review in just a moment, go over a few things uh, that we went over <clears throat> the last uh, message as we began Psalm 25. In just a moment, bring us back up to where we need to be uh, for the preaching tonight. But I want to encourage you, uh, as we've been doing the last uh, several services, uh, we've taken a missionary of the week and been praying for them. We should always be praying for our missionaries, and uh, we've been praying specifically uh, for certain ones each week. And of course, we ask the church and those that are listening uh, this week to be praying for Brother Walter Hornung, uh, of course, our missionary to Germany. Germany, uh, doing a great work, been there many, many years, and being faithful to what the Lord called them to do. So I want to encourage you uh, to be praying for Brother Walter, his wife, uh, that the Lord would continue to, to protect them, watch over them, uh, especially in the difficult times that we're living in. I want to draw your attention tonight, uh, for the sake of time, we're not going to read verse 1 down through verse number 7. But I want us to uh, read verse number 6 and 7. We're going to have a word of prayer. Uh, we're going to give a few notes here and then begin the message that the Lord has laid upon our heart. If you found your place in verse number 6, uh, whether you're here or at home, give us a good amen. The Bible said, Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness, for they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me from, for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and mercy. We thank you for your grace. What a privilege it is to be here in your house tonight. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the liberty and the freedom to pray tonight and call upon your precious name. Father, I pray for those that are here and Lord, those that are at home, wherever they may be listening to this message tonight. I pray the Spirit of God in power would take your word and burn it to hearts and seal it to souls. May we be forever changed from your word. Father, if they be one lost, I pray tonight be the glorious night. The Holy Spirit of God would draw them. They would give their heart and their life to you. Lord, we'll thank you for it. We'll praise you for it. We ask you to make our preaching easy tonight. For it's in Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to take us back briefly uh, to verse uh, number one through verse Verse uh, number five, of course, that we dealt with. We're going to look at that uh, a, little, uh, a little more in detail in just a moment. But uh, I want to remind you that as we went through the book of Psalms, we began Psalm 1 and carrying through. If you remember, as we've said many, many times, and I don't want to be too repetitious, but I've found, and this is no, uh, this is no slight towards Christian people or myself. I would be included in that. But sometimes it takes repetition for us to get it. You may have got it the first time. It may take 10 times before someone else gets it. But we look from uh, Psalm chapter 16 through Psalm 24, we dealt with Christ in prophecy. Matter of fact, we landed on the week, uh, Easter week, we landed on Psalm 22, one of the most wonderful chapters in all of the Bible dealing with the crucifixion and the agony of the death of our Lord and Savior. But as we come to Psalm 25, there's a, if you will, there is a tone change and we're dealing specifically with David. And I want to take, uh, I want to take a little bit of time and say to you that from Psalm 25 through Psalm 39 is a new segment that is written by a man that is looking into his past, his present, and his future 
and is living in the midnight hour. Can I, can I get a witness tonight in the fact that if we've been a Christian more than 24 hours, we probably endured or are praying through the midnight hour. There's some things in our life that we're having to deal with as a child of God. And here it is a very great comfort to me when I read of a man of such stature, of a man of such caliber, a man that was known after God's own heart, the greatest king that ever sat on the throne of Israel. Here we find that he is not exempt from the midnight hour. He is not exempt from problems in his life. And may I encourage every child of God that is listening tonight that you are in good company and just because you're in a midnight hour or a midnight crisis does not mean God has forsook you. It does not mean that God has forgotten you. It does not mean that God does not love you. Uh, my friend, can I encourage you tonight by saying uh, you're in good company when you read about a man such as David that finds himself in the midnight hour. We find from Psalm 25 through 39, we find this tone, if you will. Notice verse number one. The Bible said unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. We took a little bit of time and dealt with this fact. We're going to move on. Here we find he is no longer lifting up his song, but he's lifting up his soul unto God. I, we took just a moment and said there's many Christians that can live in the mountain peak moment of Golgotha. They are those that can live on the mountain plain of Psalm 23, mountain peak of Golgotha, Psalm 22. Thou preparest a table before me. They can live on a mountain pinnacle of Psalm 24. What a glorious Psalm that that is. But my friend, can I say to you that if you are a real, true child of God, uh, you're saved by the grace of God, you're not always going to be on the mountaintop. You're going to experience the valley. And we gave some verses for that. Psalm 3 and 2 said, Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God, Salah. Can I go ahead and say this? If you're a child of God tonight and the only way you're going to make it is for your buddies to brag on you, for your friends to tell you what a good job you're doing, you're not going to make it too far in this Christian life. Can I go ahead and just mark off a place and say to you, child of God, your faith and your spiritual walk needs to go farther than just what you've read on social media. Your, your faith faith needs to go farther than a pat on the back and a head nod and a wink telling you that you're doing a wonderful job because fact of the matter is we're not all going to agree all on the same thing at the same time and sooner or later my friend you are going to have a disagreement but I'm glad hallelujah my salvation goes much further than just social media my salvation goes much further further than just a pat on the back, a nod, a wink of the eye. My friend, can I say to you, in the darkest hours of my life is when I found such a gracious God that has been greater in those very moments than any time in my life. I don't want, I'm not trying to say to you that I'm wanting a valley experience. I'm not saying to you that I'm welcoming problem, but I will say this to you, friend. If you'll rest in the very hands of God in the storms of your life you'll find the God that you read about, the God that you've heard about, the God that I'm preaching about to be the God that'll be true he'll be real, he'll be there in that midnight hour and he'll be more real in that moment than he's ever been before in your life
life. What a blessing. What an honor it is to serve that kind of God. But we saw him as he was no longer lifting a song, but he was lifting his soul. Then we talked about his surrender, that trust that we found in verse number two. Oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. My goodness, we have those enemies, don't we? Then we find that he dealt with the embarrassment, the uh, being ashamed. Notice he says it twice, uh, two more times, twice in verse number three. Yet uh, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without a cause. And we encourage those that were present, those that were watching by YouTube or by uh, social media, Facebook, we encouraged you to trust in the Lord. And then not only we see him lifting his soul, his surrendered heart, but we talked about the statutes that are found in verse number four and five. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. We spent a good bit of time talking about the statutes. He said, show me thy ways. We gave three thoughts on wanting to be led, willing to be led, and waiting to be led. We find all of those in verse number four and verse number five. But, but I want to move on tonight. Matter of fact, the first section of this chapter goes from verse number one through verse number seven. If you You'll notice there are 22, uh, 22 verses in this chapter. This is also known as a psalm that uses every one of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet in this particular chapter. You hear people say that from time to time. So we take it in sections. We want to finish this first section tonight if we can. And then we, we may move on to the second section. I don't know how long I've been up here, how much time I got. God, I want to be mindful of those that are sitting at home and uh, and listening to this. But I want us to I want us to carry on a little bit further. We've read the text tonight, verse number six and verse number seven, and so we want to we want to close, if you will, these first seven verses, this first part of this chapter. I found some very interesting truths as I began to study and to to look a, a little further in these two verses. I want you to take a pen or a pencil or a marker if you're following along and taking notes. I want you to notice some of the words that are here in verse number six. We'll skip the word remember just for a moment. We'll come back to that in a, in a few moments. But notice this. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies. I want to first of all bring you, as many of you probably know where we're already going. Notice that capital A capital O, capital R, capital D, remember O Lord, the existing one, the almighty one, the God Jehovah. And here we find David praying to the existing one. And he said, remember O Lord thy tender mercies. First of all, I want to say that I'm thankful that they're his mercies as we said in another place, I believe it was Sunday night. I'm thankful that it's his mercy. He knows when to give them. He knows how much I need and he gives more than I need because if it was me I would have already bankrupt heaven. I would have already used up all the mercy when I didn't need it or not had enough when I didn't need it. But I'm glad that God is always on time. But I want to give you this thought. I found this interesting. Here the Bible said thy tender mercy. I begin to study this tender mercies and I found in, in the strong concordance and a little deeper in digging that this tender mercies, Brother Ken, is actually referring to a womb or a mother carrying 
sick or being with child. Can I say this to you? Aren't you thankful that the Lord is tender with his mercy? Aren't you thankful? I mean, think about it. You see these mothers, you know, they get excited and they get overjoyed and they love their children. At least I hope they do. And if you don't, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Somebody hit me. But can I say, you see those mothers when they get a little further along, seven, eight months, or get a little closer to their due date, boy, and a lot of it's probably no doubt from pain and and uh, and, and all that they're going through. But boy, they're so careful and they'll they'll hold on to that belly and they'll rub that belly and, and uh, they'll, boy, they get tickled when they feel that child when he kicks for the first time or when they roll over and boy, they feel that elbow come around and, and that mother, it just thrills the heart and the soul of that mother as she uh, just basically, I guess you could say for lack of better terminology, she'll cradle her belly and just love, I mean, she already loves that baby before the baby ever discovers America. Amen. I mean, she's already in love with that baby. She's never counted his fingers or toes. She's never been able to sing a lullaby to it, but she loves that baby. And when that baby begins to move and that baby, and here's what's a crazy thing. I, I, I thought about the, I told Susan this. As a matter of fact, when she had Megan, it's a, an amazing thing. She was there for uh, many, many hours. I think close to 36 hours by the time she delivered. And uh, needless to say, she wasn't all that happy. Somebody hit me. Amen. And, uh, but, but can I say this? I told her after uh, Megan was born, I said, I, I guess you're going to want to wait a while to have another young. She said, you know, it's an amazing thing when you look into the face of that little baby that you have longed for and you've labored for and you've hurt for when you see that baby and them, them, those gums and they smile and they're not really smiling. Maybe they got gas. I don't know what they got. But that little screwed step face, that mama forgets every bit of the pain, forgets every bit of the sorrow, forgets every bit of the labor when she looks into the eyes of that little newborn baby. Can I say this to you? Hallelujah. Glory to the living God. I'm glad when Jesus hung on the cross, Isaiah said, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. I believe every time a child of God is birthed into the family of God and a lamb is born again, I believe Jesus said it's worth every mile. It was worth every stride. It was worth the crown of thorns. It was worth hanging on the cross because he loves us. He cradles us. He can't wait to that day. Hallelujah. I believe when Stephen was being stoned and Jesus stood at the right hand of the Father, if the Father to give the word, he'd have come for the church. I believe he's longing for the day. He's rejoicing in the day that one day, hallelujah, the rapture, hey, that trumpet's going to sound. We're leaving here. Glory to God and spend eternity with him. The one that loves us, the one that died for us, the one that rose again for us. Hallelujah. I'm going to have to move on. Isn't that a good thought? Amen. I'm thankful for the tender mercy, that womb. I'm glad, hallelujah, when he was carrying me. I don't want to go too far, but I'm thankful when the Spirit of God was drawing me. I'm thankful for that moment when I bowed my knees before thrice holy God and give my heart to him. Hallelujah. I'm glad that he loves us tonight. But can I say not only do we find those tender mercy speaking of the womb, but it's compassion. It's a tender love, but let's move on. Notice the next thing here, thy tender mercy. Then notice this, and thy loving kindness. I heard uh, Dr. J. Vernon McGee make, <clears throat> make this illustration. It's a pretty good illustration, which all it done was made me hungry. But he said he, he heard of a little girl. She, uh, they, she was asked uh, to explain what, uh, what love and kindness, what this, this, uh, this love and kindness, what's the difference? She said, well, kindness is when you ask your mama for some buttered, some, some melted buttered, uh, butter on some bread. Said, that's kindness, mama taking care of it. But when you just say, mama, I want some butter on, on 
a piece of toast, some melted butter, and when she brings it to you, it don't only, not only does it have that melted butter, but she's done put the jam on it. Hallelujah. I don't know. I mean, I've ate toast and I like it. It'll do, but I'd rather use a terminology that maybe God, when I said, Lord, would you remember thy loving kindness? He said, well, I'm going to butter you a big old biscuit and I'm going to put some homemade preserves on the top. Hallelujah. I'm glad not only has he showed me kindness, but he showed me loving kindness. Hallelujah. It's a tender loving kindness, tender mercy. Glory to God. I'm thankful that the Lord, if you let him, he'll not only love you, but he'll put a little jam on the top. Amen. Notice something else we find here. Boy, this is interesting. We find not only this loving kindness, not only we find this tender mercy, but notice uh, we, we've given several thoughts and we give them to you a moment ago. The statutes, the soul, the surrender. Number four, let's carry on. I want to give this last thought in these seven verses, this sorry, being uh, asking for forgiveness. Notice what he said. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions according to thy mercy, Remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O oh Lord. I can honestly say tonight, Timothy Dakota, I, I believe in my heart a man could take this one verse and preach a lifetime and never exhaust it. I'm thankful that the Lord, hey, I, I notice then, notice he began verse number six with the word remember. He was asking the Lord to remember something. And then verse number seven, he used the word remember again, but he said, Lord, remember not the sins of my youth, nor, nor my transgression. Now, hold on just a minute. I looked up that word, that word remember here in Psalm 25. You know what meaning it carries? Of course, it means to recall. It means to mark. But you know what else it means, Brother Ron? It means to burn in sins. I thought to myself, I like to have a shout and fit. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I thought about this very thought. I'm glad when the psalmist David, this is a prayer. Didn't we say that? Psalm 25, he's praying to the Lord. And the psalmist David, he's praying to the Lord. He said, Lord, here's what I want you to do. I want you to remember your loving kindness. I want you to remember your tender mercy. They're yours. and they're, they're, Hey, you can give them to me. But then he come to verse 7 and said, but Lord, I want you to forget about, I want you to remember not that all the those sins in my youth. Well, number one, I'm glad, hallelujah, God doesn't have no flaws. These people run around, hey, woo, the Lord's forgot about my sin. No, he hadn't forgotten nothing, friend. He chose to remember them no more. And can I say to you, I come to that meaning of remember to burn in sins. You know what David was really saying? Lord, I'm praying to you. You know the judge. You know the God. You know the existing one, the Jehovah over the psalm, would you go talk to him and would you offer up a prayer of incense on my behalf and forgive my sin, don't hold them against me and Lord I want you to forget if you can, remember no more the sins of my youth. Isn't that a wonderful thought? I'm thankful that he prayed on our behalf. Matter of fact, I want to share a couple of verses will you that I shared uh, Sunday morning I believe it was Hebrews 4 15 one of my favorite verses in the book of Hebrew for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities but was in all, in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin hallelujah yet without sin I, if you remember those of you that's in the Bible college uh, the first semester we covered a little bit of this verse and we talked about the fact he, uh, the Lord has the Lord been tempted with uh, with uh, with the ways that we've been tempted today. Well, they wasn't uh, they wasn't the, uh, just by the touch of a finger or uh, a touch of a key. The, the things that we have today, but I believe what He was speaking, uh, being in all points tempted as we are, we're tempted in three ways: the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And the Lord, in all of those ways, were tempted as you and 
die. But you know what the Bible said? He was without sin. Hallelujah. I'm glad. Hallelujah. I got somebody praying on my behalf that has not sinned and he had died and he died for me. Hallelujah. And then we talked about 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 and verse 9 where he said my grace is sufficient for thee for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly therefore will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Amen. Glory to God for that. Amen. Let's move on. We're going to have to move on. So we notice the end of verse number seven. The Bible says then, notice what he said, <clears throat> according to thy mercy, here's this word again, remember thou me for thy goodness sake. Now, let me slow down just a moment and maybe say it this way. Men, how many times you've been in the prayer room and you've got a burden on your heart, you've got a problem and you lift your hand, Brother Billy calls you to, uh, to give your request and you'll say, uh, brethren, remember me when you pray. Yes, sir. Would you remember me? I, I, hey, all this is lining up. I mean, David said, Lord, I'm praying to you. You're praying on my behalf. And if you would, would you remember me? Notice what he said. Remember me. Remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O oh Lord. Amen. I wrote here in, in, my, in my notes, I'm thankful for those three words. Remember thou me. You know what that reminds me of, Brother Ken? It reminds me of an old sinner that was condemned and doomed yes. that was hanging on a cross. Yes. And he he didn't know all of the he didn't know all of the elo eloquent words and the eloquent terminology of what he needed to say. He looked to the Lord and said, Lord, would you remember me? Yes. Would you remember me? Jesus said today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. I don't know all the words to say. God knows that I don't. I'm not real smart and it's not really, hey, if you wait to, to find some fault in me, it won't take you too long. But I'm thankful, hallelujah, when I come to the Lord. I, I may not have wrote none of the psalm, but I'm thankful when I think of the psalmist David, he in all of his eloquent speaking, all of his, all of the hymns and the songs that he wrote, all of the psalms and, and, uh, and all the vocabulary that he used, when he come to this place he kept repeating himself and he said Lord would you simply remember me notice what he said he said remember remember thou me notice this for thy goodness sake now I'm not foolish enough to think I can come to the Lord and say Lord would you remember me for my sake I don't believe that I in any way am worthy enough to do that. But I can sure come to him and say, Lord, would you remember me for your sake? Yes, sir. <laughs> Boy, there's some preaching in this verse. I'm going to have to move on. There's some, we leave a lot of preaching behind. <clears throat> Maybe someone else take that and run with it. Amen. Notice what else. So we've closed out now this first this first little section. I'm going to just hurry through. Don't know how long I've been preaching. Evidently, <clears throat> Maybe long enough. I don't know. <clears throat> but I want to give you the, uh, verse 8 through verse 14. Not going to read it all tonight. Well, I'm going to fib to you if I tell you that. We're going to have to read some of it. Verse number 8. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore will he teach sinners in the way. Here we find <clears throat> number 1. I'm going to give you right quick. I'm going to give you about four things here right real quick. He comes to the Lord and he's remember thou me for thy goodness sake O Lord. Verse 8. Here we find this thought. Man must be saved. Good and upright is the Lord therefore will he teach sinners in the way. I, I, I don't want to I don't want to offend nobody per se on purpose. But if it does, I, 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 don't, I don't mean it that way. But 
it's an amazing thing, amazing thing to me. Everybody that dies goes to heaven. Yeah. I mean, everybody that dies. You know, these people don't even believe in heaven, but when their loved one dies, well, they went to heaven. And uh, and I'm not and I'm not the judge. That's between them. Though, hey, if an old sinner like me can be saved, Lord, and save me, hey, who am I to say they're not saved? That's not my place. But I will say this: good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, will He teach sinners in the way. The Lord's not going to lower His standard for you or I. He's going to be who He is every day, every year, every decade, every century. God's who He is. We're going to see that again here just in a moment. But here we find in the Scripture <clears throat> that man must be saved. Romans 2, 4, Paul said it this way, Or despisest thou the riches of His goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. My friend, I'm thankful for the goodness of God. Number two, notice verse number nine. The Bible said, the meek will he guide in judgment and the, and the meek will he teach his way. Not only should we be, must be saved, we must be submissive. You ever heard the old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Let me tell you, let me tell you something I learned early in the ministry. If somebody's living a certain way or, or, or doing a certain thing in church and doing things in their life on your account and not God's account, you can forget it. That's a, that's a bomb waiting to explode. And so not only do we need to be saved, but we must be submissive. My friend, if, if you expect God to bless you and do what you want him to do, then friend, you must submit to him. He's not going to submit to you. You can rest assured of that. The very God of heaven, he submits to no one. And so we find must be saved, must be submissive. Notice verse 10. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimony. Must be saved, must be submissive. We must be shown. Let me ask you tonight. I hear a lot of people, they, they say, well, I want to live for the Lord. I want to do this. I want to do that. Well, are you sure? Are you sure you're wanting to live for him because your actions and there again, I'm not passionate. I'm just how the Holy Spirit lets the chips fall tonight. But, but our actions sure don't show that, does it? Yeah. Our actions don't say, oh, I'm going to serve the Lord. Hey, and can I go ahead and say this and just be real honest with you, Brother Ron? I got, hey, I got my own set of problems. Hey, man, I got, hey, I got way too many of my own problems to be pointing the finger at somebody else. And so let's notice what else we find. Must be saved, must be submissive, must be sure. And notice in verse 10, I want to point this out. Hey, it's his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimony. It's his, it's his testimonies. It's his covenant. It's his paths. Amen. And so we must be sure it's his way. Number four, and then we're going to draw it on down here. Number four must be simple. Notice verse 11. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is is great. Here in this second section, we find that same echo from the psalmist David. That same echo. He said, pardon my iniquity. Why? For thy name's sake. Uh, you know, something I've learned about true repentance, and we're bringing it to a close. Y'all bear with us just a moment. What I found out about true repentance True repentance won't come to apologize and have a, have a whole bucket full of excuses. Yes. Amen. Right. Hey you hear somebody trying to get right with God and they're trying to explain all of why they're done and, and what they're done. Hey, that's not true repentance. 
Because the fact of the matter is God already knows all about it. He's not waiting for you to explain all of why you done. He knows why you done what you done. He knows why I done what I done. And so what he's asking for is true, genuine, heartfelt repentance. That's what we find in verse number 11. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. Boy, I'm thankful that I've been pardoned. Amen. Verse number 12. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. You know what else? I'm going to get some funny looks when I say that. We must be scared. You say, preacher, what do you mean by that? Hey, we need to fear God. Yes, sir. We need to fear him. You know what kind of fear I'm talking about? To reverence him. And I'll be real honest, people say, and I, I, I've heard this, and I've seen, so, and, and the people, they, uh, they want to say, well, you know, you shouldn't really truly fear the Lord. You shouldn't be afraid of Him. Well, let me tell you something. I, I'll say this, I do reverence Him, and it's a godly fear, and I re but I, I'll be real honest with you. He makes me a little nervous. Yes, sir, yeah. Amen. I mean, he makes me a little nervous. I don't get, people don't make me, people don't make me too nervous, but he makes me a little nervous. I'm not going to lie to you. I've got a little fear in my heart. Matter of fact, I got a whole lot of fear in my heart. Amen. Verse number 14, we're closing. Here it is. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. The last one I want to give you tonight must be secretive. There is confidence in the Lord. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. You know what I found? Now, I love hearing good news and having a, uh, having a brother encourage me. And boy, that, that does. That goes a long way. But you know what? When I spend some, some quiet time, just me and the Lord, and I hear the voice of God speak to me, there's nothing takes the place of the confidence God can give in that secret moment. I'm afraid we're living in a day, I'm afraid we're living in a day today that people want to be seen and heard when the fact of the matter, the very power of God rests in what is between you and Him and you alone. Amen. Father, we thank you for your love and mercy. We thank you for your grace. Thank you for your word. I pray God you'd take it, use it for your honor and glory tonight. For it's in Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Psalm 103 and verse 1 said to bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Good evening. May the Lord bless you. I'm going to have uh, some music here, give you an opportunity to pray, do business with God. And I hope you'll, if you're sitting there with your family, you'll pray with your family and, uh, and just uh, have a good time between you and, and the Lord and allow God to deal with your heart tonight.